a lot of expectations have been building up with this uh, 10 minutes delay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for waiting for me. I mean, I was a bit stuck in this uh, beautiful, complex system of transport close to this uh, place. Um, so thanks for being here. And I see you enjoyed a bit the waiting time. So I tried to entertain you a bit with the remaining part of the next minutes. Uh, excellent. And I'll be speaking about uh, disruption. So things that don't go as you expect, uh, mostly in public transport network and mostly in railways. And I try to connect to your experience, maybe try to explain what could be complicated or easy uh, for this. Let me see if this even works. Yeah, excellent. So what I prepared for your entertainment is basically four parts of this presentation. The first part, unfortunately, is going to be a bit modeling, so a bit of mathematics, or at least a bit of understanding how you can actually model those disruptions as we are, in a sense, scientists. We are not, let's say, we are obliged to make something mathematically safe. Then I'm going to speak about some uh, refreshing ideas which turn out to be different than what we expected, and somehow unexpected things turning out good, so at least to put a bit of surprise. And then uh, typically disruptions mean passengers disruptions, means that people don't know what to do, a bit like I felt uh, five minutes ago. And uh, you are combining, let's say, a lot of information sources with a lot of possible action space. And this means a lot of interactions that can be studied more or less complicated way with a lot of frameworks. And then I'm gonna close this talk with some understanding, so some ongoing research that we're doing in Zurich that is trying to address those issues that we know uh, yet unanswered. So let's say things that are um, still open for understanding and for research in this sense. Oh, sorry, okay. So I'll start with some models. Basically, the models I'm talking about are railway traffic control models that are basically how to answer at bad situations like this, where you have an unexpected object on your tracks Whatever it can be, let's say a cow is still relatively friendly, you can have uh, other things, you can have failures, you can have uh, people on the tracks, you can have uh, bad weather accidents. And the idea is that you have to reduce the impact of those things. So I mean, the cow itself is not a problem, but the delay to your system is. And the delay caused by the delay, so kind of snowball effect is even worse, because that's something you could actually uh, reduce. And uh, this relates to our typical framework of controlling transport networks. Probably some of you are doing very similar things. And controlling transport networks is relatively easy, especially in very extreme cases. So if I want to go from here to there, it's very easy because I don't need to ask permission to anybody. I don't need to have a driving license. I don't need to plan a tunnel, a bridge, or whatever infrastructure. In real life, it's not so easy. In real life, you have links with capacity. When you have too many cars on the same place, these starts interact with each other, you start having a lot of troubles, you start having speed or performance, which is not anymore what was promised to you. And um, what we are studying in railways is basically an extreme case in this sense, because the capacity of links in railways is basically the smallest it can be. So it can only be one unit at a time. 
Einstein highways, maybe you can put hundreds of cars per link or even more depending on how you define your links, but in railways really at the minimum possible you can have. And this is very interesting for research because it leads to very structured combinatorial approaches. So we can actually model what vehicles are doing. We have one opportunity in railways is that we know which vehicles we are running. So we know basically everything about our vehicles, our drivers, those drivers are employees, so they are supposed to follow our advices. So there's no such problem as compliance in this sense. We can kind of steer the system exactly as we want. And the issues are related to the interaction. And disruption, let's say you can interpret it as a strong reduction in capacity of some part of your network. And this makes it even more evident that there is some interaction, let's say. So the disruption is like a trigger to understand even more the constraint dynamics of a system. Um, to explain a bit how railway works, for those of you that maybe are not super familiar, I prefer this uh, tiny example. So let's assume that you are somewhere here, which probably is another city, another state even, and you go somewhere there. Of course, maybe you want to go even closer to your university, but let's say you are basically finding this path from A to B. And probably most of you would be able to do this problem, let's say to solve this problem easily. I mean, you can use tools like Google Maps or whatever you want. When you solve such a problem of routing, let's say in a uh, space network, what you do is basically you are considering two kinds of constraints. One constraint, which you see here in black, are basically feasibility constraints. Like you are not still able to walk over water, so you need to use a bridge or a tunnel to cross the river. And those are, let's say, these black areas here. So those are areas where you cannot pass, and then you have to find a way to just use the remaining parts of the network can actually be used. And then you have some yellow parts, which are kind of optimality constraints. So areas you would like to avoid, but sometimes you can, sometimes you cannot avoid them. So maybe because there is too much traffic, too much tourists, and it's stinky, I don't know, some ex-partner lives there, or you don't like the people, whatever you want. But let's say all problems have this kind of structure. So you have some strong feasibility constraint and some soft optimality constraint. And the problem of finding the shortest path basically has to avoid the black areas and minimize the exposure in the yellow ones. Now, probably what you know about railways is that railway can only go over a railway line. Means here we are looking at a space, so at an area. We instead translate this to a line. So a line is monodimensional. So this allows me to put only the line on the horizontal part. And on the vertical part, I can put time. So you can see movement, let's say, in a bit easier way. And exactly the same profile, let's say, can be interpreted as a railway movement in which you have exactly the same constraint. So you have black areas where trains cannot move, and these are typically related to the fact that other trains are there, or there are maintenance works, or there are breakdown, whatever you want. And then there are yellow areas, which are, <laughs> is this working at all? Okay, very good. Just that I was thinking of. Um, the, you have yellow areas where uh, you get uh, malus, let's say, you, you get non-performance in case uh, this goes there. And in case of a space and time diagram, here you see a very bad thing, so that basically your unit is keeping the same space for a very long time, which means it's stuck waiting somewhere. And here you get a similar picture in which your unit is going very slowly, moving, but still moving. And the problem with railways is that these black and yellow areas, like in the geography case, are not static, are not fixed. They move over time. Actually, every train moving is causing black and yellow areas, so performance, uh, negative performance and blocking to other trains. So while I'm routing my unit, I actually am annoying all other units and vice versa. So that's why it's somehow challenging and combinatorially interesting to study railway system. Um, I'm going to give you a very, very crash course on how you can solve these problems. Basically, you have three problems to solve, let's say. The very first one is to separate traffic, so to respect these black areas. Uh, people, in particular passengers, don't like so much when two trains are too close to each other. And to do this, let's say, we typically use uh, a large model, so a large operation research model, because computer science rules, let's say, if then, would be very good at modeling this. So if a 
if a unit is occupying a place that nobody else can enter. So it's very easy to write it down and very easy to implement, but it's very easy to get into the next uh, kind of problem, which is if you have a line, only one line, you have one train coming from one direction, another train from the other direction, these two cannot cross each other, let's say, keeping their mechanical properties, maybe some quantum space that can do this. Then basically, if you make this kind of rules, then in this case, they get stuck, and then your simulation is uh, blocked forever. So to avoid this problem, you need to have a bigger picture, so understanding all possible ways to solve problems, and that's why we write some mathematical model that implicitly describes all possible choice of orders and sequences. If we're able to do those two things, actually we can reduce delays, and that's what typically people like. So finding the order between two trains is basically a crucial sequencing problem. Avoiding deadlocks, as people call this situation, is related to the big formula, let's say a very large mathematical program, which is very bad computationally speaking. So it scales very badly because these constraints here, so one order, or the other order are actually very badly written in a mixed integer linear model. And then we have an objective function, we can assume it's delay, so some delay function, which is function of time, which is function of the arrival time of the units at their some space. And uh, I don't want to bother you too much with this, but let's say those models actually work, and work pretty nicely now. So those are instances from the Netherlands where I was doing my PhD, and this was work I started at the time, so you have a very complicated network, maybe the size of New York uh, transit area, with a lot of trains per hour and a lot of units moving over small pieces of infrastructure. So a lot of many uh, binary constraints and, and combinatorial constraints. We put some delay in entrance and we get some delay in output. And uh, the delay in output is very much saying what we get. So this uh, colorful picture basically reports the delay on the x-axis and the probability. So traffic is very various and we did some Monte Carlo studies so you get a lot of possible outcomes. And I want you to remember only two things. So if you look at the black one, this is the easiest you can do. So you keep a timetable which you define maybe one year in advance, maybe one week in advance, you just stretch it. This is very easy, it's not particularly difficult. This has terrible performance in terms of average delay, maybe 40, 50 seconds, and in terms of variability. So it goes from zero all the way to much, much. So basically traffic is very unstable in this sense. And uh, the red one is less variable and less delay. These are typical implementation of real life. The blue one is the first in, first out, or first come, first serve, which is doing relatively good but is ignoring traffic heterogeneity. So in case of uh, New York subway, basically all cars are doing the same service. But in mainline network for train, you have slow train, fast train, heavy train, light train, freight passengers. So you have a lot of variability. That's why the optimization approach in green is actually doing very good in terms of delay variability and delay average. So this is the state of the art of railway traffic control, more or less. And uh, the question I'm proposing, okay, now I have these models, I understand it, let me use it for disruption management. That was what I was proposing to you at the very beginning. So assume you have a similar network, also from the Netherlands. One line is partially closed. So instead of two tracks, you have only have one. And you have to use the remaining capacity to run everything. Can you use the model I just introduced? Uh, yes and no. Let's say yes, in the sense you can compute a solution, but no, because this uh, solution would have so much traffic delay. So in real life, what happens, people cancel trains in this situation. If you allow the computer to cancel train, the optimal solution without delay is the one without train. So if you have no train, there's no delay. So it's a very, very quick solution, but probably not what people would like. So actually, to solve disruption management, we need to make one step, an intermediate step which is basically to compute alternative timetables. And uh, here you see the timetable in terms of line planning. So the blue trains are fast train and the green trains are local trains. And you can have, let's say four, you can have six, uh, two per hour. You can have some train that do actually a big detour, but keep running. 
So you can compute a lot of those theoretical ways to solve it. This is limited, let's say, by your fantasy if you want. So some of them are doing shuttle services, some others are doing true services. Say so we computed the R12 uh, or uh, something like this, but you could do as many as you want. And for each of them, we have a timetable. We can actually compute a railway traffic management solution. And that's what happens in the next uh, slide. The problem is that we have a lot of performance indicators. So delay itself is not good enough. So what we measured is a lot of passenger-related performance indicator, typically gener generalized travel time, so waiting plus traveling plus connection plus access plus egress time, and frequency of services, how many frequent services you can run. And I put some color codes, so you don't need to get crazy looking at the numbers, and all rows are one of the picture I showed you here. So those rows are reported here. And if you want to choose something, what you're gonna choose is probably the bottom one, which is the greenest, which is the one you cannot run because that's the reference timetable, it's your benchmark, so I'm sorry. So you have to choose something else and it's not an easy choice. And if you look on the operator's point of view, so not, not the passengers, but just the operators, then you look at delays, uh, knock-on delays, so snowball effect, punctuality, capacity, that's even more complicated, that's even less easy to find a solution. So that's why I was telling you those are bad models because they're not able to express the complexity of human decisions under these circumstances. In real life, people don't know what to choose. They uh, have some very limited support. It would be nice to try all of them, but they just say, okay, in this case, I better be safe than sorry. So typically they cancel a lot of train, which passenger, of course, feel a bit badly. And this project actually started trying to understand, trying to make a discrete choice model, whatever, of what operators were doing. And the answer is uh, unfortunately not so positive. But I promise you some unexpected good things. So let me elaborate a bit on this. So maybe some of you have been to Europe or Germany. This, what you see there, is a beautiful castle in southern Germany. It's uh, basically what people knew about the city called Rastatt until a couple of years ago. So everybody in Germany maybe knew this place. Nobody, of course, outside Germany knew. It's a small town. But let's say everybody thought about the city with this beautiful castle. But uh, this happened until uh, 2017. And then people now realize this city, they remember it for this, which was a major accident. Basically, this city is crossed by a railway line. And people, as many, in many places, let's say, are annoyed by the railway line. So they say, can we make a bypass? So they start digging a tunnel to go around the city and not cross it anymore. And while um, drilling the tunnel, basically, they had to cross the old railway line. And that's what you see here. So the old railway line collapsed. The tunnel is broken. Uh, you have to fill it with concrete. Uh, you have to leave the machine inside. So for two months, no train was passing. And the bypass, it would be the ideal solution and it did not exist. So for two months, you basically have no whatsoever traffic on this line. And people will say, okay, who cares? And the problem is that this rust that is basically in the wrong place. So this is Europe and here you have the Netherlands, the big ports, Rotterdam, Hamburg, that are basically the port of entry for many goods from East Asia. Here is Italy, Genoa, the Mediterranean Sea. So there is this major freight corridor. And if you zoom in, this is more or less what's happening. And Rastad is exactly there in the middle of this major corridor. So basically, this disruption actually blocked a major line for moving people and goods. And what we did as uh, outsiders, so we are not in Germany, but we are in Switzerland, so this country here down. What we did, we only studied the delays and did Swiss cities, which we have very good open data for this, during the period of disruption. So the idea is, okay, what's happening during the disruption, how bad it is, can we see something from the realized data? So I'm gonna show you some uh, uh, time series plots of cancellation and delays in the network during the disruption. So you can already think what you would expect. The first thing, let's say at least if you were uh, following a bit my previous talk is, cancellation. So typically what you do in this case, you cancel a lot of trains. And here I see I put one year of data. 
with two months of disruption in red. And let's say this is basically all possible sources of cancellation, let's say accident, maintenance, seasonality, whatever. But the quick message is that there was not much more cancellation or much less cancellation than usual. Let's say it's kind of okay for being a stochastic system. So in Switzerland, no more trains were cancelled than usual. Of course, in Germany, where the disruption was, that was another story. And passenger, of course, had to cross this, so there were some bus bridging, some other services. For freight, it was a mess, because you cannot use a bus bridging to move containers or goods, so they had to find very complicated solution. But let's say what I want you to remember is that cancellation was still okay for passenger trains. Then we look at delay of passenger traffic. Here you have the moving average. This is the delay per station per day, basically. And what you see is that the disrupted period in red actually shows much less delay than normal. I mean, so it's, it was visibly better during the disruption than outside. What I see, what, you sh what I show here is the delay of trains coming from Germany. So those trains that were supposed to go over the disruption, they did not because it was impossible, so they were short turned. So instead of running maybe 1,000 kilometers, they were running 200 kilometers. So they were accumulating less stochastic influence. As a consequence, they had better on-time performance. So this is still kind of understandable why the performance was better. Then what we look at uh, is other trains, trains that had nothing to do with the disruption, were just happening to run in the network, but were affected by the delay of other trains or by the performance of other trains. So secondary effect. And also in this case, you can see that in the part of the network which are affected, so directly interacting, the delay actually was less. So the performance was better during the disruption than not. So having some filter somewhere that blocks propagation of delay to your network actually improves your network. Of course, the network performance is good. The passenger were rating this. I mean, that's obvious. And we also checked other stations somewhere else, and actually they were kind of no normal, let's say. So it was not, I don't know, bad weather or a football club, I don't know, some strange effect that we could not uh, justify otherwise. So to summarize this uh, small part about strange and good effects, we could study with this disruption analysis what does it mean to be an isolated network. So if you are an interconnected network, it's very good for people and goods, they can move, but it's very bad because it's more vulnerable to propagation of bad, bad side effects. And here you see basically the, in green, you see how better it was during the disruption compared to not. So you see some networks directly connected to the line were actually doing much better, especially for the high percentile. So the very big delay were very much reduced. And uh, in a sense, the passengers were facing this. So you could understand that the network was doing better, but the passengers were actually feeling much worse because they had to transfer. Um, take some other detour, some longer travel time, and so on. So maybe you realize with me it would be so nice to study this more in detail, but unfortunately the government said never again. It was such a big uh, disaster for the economy, let's say billions of the damages that they say no more. Yes? So are you saying that the uh, extra time is still required by the train? I know it's not still part of the extra time period required by the passenger, is that what you're saying? True, yes. So basically, yes, the problem is that we are talking about two different network perspectives. So one is the inside Switzerland only, and then the link which is somehow outside here. So the people traveling here, of course, they had terrible performance in extra travel time. We are unable to compute it actually, because there's no statistic, there's no check-in, check-out, I mean, people are just annoyed and sure. they wanted to move. Well, the only thing we could measure easily is the performance of the train inside, and this was better. But indeed, I mean, the, the two performances are different, the passenger and the network performance, and that brings me nicely to the next topic, which is how can we model this interaction? Is there a smart way we can actually understand how it works? And uh, I'll propose you two approaches. So one approach is very simple, if you want. And uh, basically it says that the network controller, so you maybe as a smart person, me or the traffic guy, are deciding what the passenger should do. So somebody decides the root choice of everybody and then you can evaluate network performance. 
And this is very easy to implement because basically you just need to make one transit assignment or one assignment problem, and then you can compute a lot of factors. So this is very easy, it's actually useful in many cases, especially if you have uh, ticketing systems. So in case you have a plane flight, you want to go, I don't know, from New York to, I don't know, San Francisco, having a ticket for one airplane doesn't mean that you are free to move around as far as you reach your destination. Uh, Somebody is deciding what you have to do. In case of uh, general public transport network, this is not the case, right? If you have a ticket from here, I don't know, to Boston, you can take one train or another train, or you can board on one station or another station. In case of urban system, even more, right? In the mess of this uh, spaghetti line in New York, you can go as far as you want from A to B. And in this case, it's very hard to understand what's going on. In a sense, if you have a link with very good network performance, many people would choose it. And as more people would choose it, maybe the network performance would change because maybe it's gonna be too crowded or maybe it's gonna face some delay from passenger, who knows what. And this case, of course, is much more interesting for research because we don't understand what's going on. So this needs some coordination. We might need to study convergence in case it works or not. What is the final outcome? How far are we from the system optimum? All this, uh, say, relevant or interesting question for research. So what I'm gonna show you is some kind of studies, very quick studies on this uh, approach for railway networks under um, specific circumstances. And uh, I have to say this problem is so complex that I had to restrict myself to assumptions that are almost unrealistic. I mean. So forgive me for this, but let's say knowing a lot of things, so knowing exactly your passenger demand, which is something we wish we had. I mean, we don't know exactly where people are, where they want to go, as far as we are speaking about now. We, we knew this in historical sense. Assuming also that routing of passenger is only based on the shortest travel time. And that's uh, partially correct. Uh, let's say people don't want to travel so much, but we have a lot of other factors, let's say comfort, reliability, um, price, that play a role in this sense. We also assume that our vehicles have infinite passenger capacity. That looks a bit bold, but let's say for train networks is actually not terribly bad. It's a very common assumption. So with these assumptions, which are very bad, actually we can simplify our problem a lot. So we can use a schedule-based assignment, which is relatively standard, and we can include this into an optimization problem. So we can see how this problem would relate to each other. And they relate to each other in more or less this way. So assuming that I am the train controller guy, and I want to improve the welfare of passengers. So what I do, I try to minimize the delay of trains, weighted by how many passengers are inside. So if a train is full of people, this gets priority over a train which is empty, which looks somehow reasonable. But then I give some priority to the traffic, so some train would get faster, some train would get slower. My people would actually react to this, and they say, look, I'm not gonna take the slow train, I'm gonna take the fast train, which means that the route choice of passenger could be actually different. And then me, if I want to change my uh, my control decisions, let's say, to improve the travel time of passengers, we have to take other decisions because people would move somewhere else. And if I take new decisions, then people would react to this. And then you get this kind of complicated loop, which uh, formally speaking, basically is the interaction between two problems. One is the scheduling of trains. The other one is the routing or passenger assignment, which are optimizing slightly different objectives. And that's the interesting part. So with mild mathematical assumption, you can actually prove that this does not converge to any s sensible situation in some extreme cases. In normal cases, I would say it's kind of reinforcing. So if you have a train on time, more people would take it, which means that me as controller would have even more in incentive to keep it on time. So it's kind of a self-reinforcing mechanism, but in strange cases, you can actually show this doesn't work. Yeah. But let's say for this uh, setup, you could use some game theoretical approaches to model this. One very irrealistic approach is that you can compute a system optimum. Assuming you know everybody, everybody complies to what you want to do, you can say, look, that's the best solution you can ever get. Of course, that's not real life proof because people would take some different decision, people would not know, people would not be able to tell what they want to do in advance. 
Well, if they only for mathematical purposes, you could actually compute them in a way. Then you can compute kind of a reactive process, so kind of an Ash equilibrium in which somebody takes a decision, the other player reacts, and then the other player reacts to the reaction and so on. And the interesting part is that the train control guy is one person, but the passenger are actually many. So you have a many to one game. Assuming passenger are uh, homogeneous, then you can still play a bit with this. You can also play with a bit more fancy game theory approach in which you have like uh, one of the player promising a rule. And that's like a Stackelberg equilibrium that you're gonna reach. Either the dispatcher, let's say traffic control guy tells the passenger, I'm gonna do this no matter what. For instance, the train control tells you the high speed train will always be first, no matter what the delay is. And then you passenger know how oh, better stick to the high speed train. Or vice versa, the passenger promise the dispatcher they're gonna do something like minimize their travel time or get the first train. And this of course leads to different solution, different stability case. So we don't know much more about this problem than this possible approaches, but what I want to show you is actually it's a relevant problem. So it's uh, actually a lot of uh, potential can be reached in terms of passenger welfare. So what I show you here is just some upper bound because we don't know the exact solutions. The problem is too complicated numerically speaking. It's a network again in the Netherlands and you see these, these are, let's say those are cities. So inside there is uh, nothing, but it basically feels like a big city, a metropolis. At the end it's uh, very similar in uh, size and density and transport and interchanges to a major city like maybe New York or Beijing or something like this. But those are heavy trains, so those are trains running every 10 minutes, every 15 minutes, and so on. And you see people, let's say, wanting to go from A to B, might have the chance to change, or they have different routes, so the assignment probably is actually relevant. And with this network, what we put, we put some uh, passenger floats, so what you see here is just a fancy picture for an origin destination matrix. So people want to go from this station to this station, you want to go from this station to this station and so on. So you get an idea of what the flows are in this uh, network over there. And then we can load this passenger onto the network and we get a picture like this, where you get the thickness if the many people want to move. And then this basically a dynamic assignment of people on the network system that are running there. So you see some links are very heavy in terms of passengers, some are very tiny, so not so many people are actually there. And in case we want to optimize this flow, so we can say, okay, a train is delayed, but there's a lot of people, so let it in first and so on. And this is kind of the final outcome. And what you see is that some uh, flows which are very big are actually managed relatively well, so yellowish. Some flows which are very tiny can be managed with very good performance or with very low delay for passengers, some links in this case are a bit unfortunate, you get some delay, you cannot do the exchange. But the idea here is that you can manage train traffic looking at the passenger and their reaction. And what numerically we can say is that actually we can achieve much better performance if you look at the problem from this point of view. So instead of caring of delaying a train, which probably we don't really care so much, but we care about delaying passengers, by delaying trains in proper places, so by enforcing transfer connection, we can achieve travel time, which is, let's say, 10% 10 10 shorter or even more. So we can actually save a lot of travel time by just having trains a bit later and picking up passengers at the right place. And uh, we don't know exactly how much it is, but let's say we are at 10% optimality gap, so let's say we can even be more positive in this sense. Yes, please. So how does the result in this figure, in this uh, yellow figure, uh, unfortunately, you cannot see this because this is a so static picture. Picture. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the first scenario, then the figure is uh, yeah. flat in terms of prototype uh, equilibrium. Yeah. And in this scenario, it didn't happen. So this is this kind of Nash equilibrium. So basically, people react to each other. But this is a static picture, so that's the flows, uh, uh, let's say, collecting all the flows on all services. And it's not divided by which service they actually take. So these links, let's say, from Amsterdam to Utrecht, actually there are maybe 15 different trains. So you mean there is no pure Nash equilibrium? Um, so in this case, there is a solution which is found and it's Nash sta stable. So let's say it doesn't move around anymore. 
in some cases you don't, but depends on how good you solve the individual problem. So if you don't solve a problem to optimality, then of course you can have some backlash. And in some cases you have multiple optimal solutions, you can swap between all of them. And in some specific case, when you have a lot of transfer connection, you can actually tell people go there, and then this delays some other train, and then people would say, but then it's better to take this other train, and then people go here, but then the train there is on time, so you get this kind of train flips. So numerically, let's say it's not perfectly fin finalized, but let's say from point of view of realistic instances, let's say it goes, it, it reaches one solution. How good and how stable is that? It's a bit tricky to say. But that, in a sense, brings me, okay, what can we do next? Can we improve this model? And here is maybe the most active part of research. And uh, this stems from the idea that passengers don't want to, let's say, they don't love having a train on time. They love doing a lot of funny things in real life, right? So assuming I have a disruption and I'm going from home to work, and there is a disruption in the afternoon peak hour. So somebody might just say, wow, it's terrible, I have one hour delay. Some other can say, look, I can find actually another trip in the network, changing somewhere else, and actually I can be maybe a bit slower, but I can still reach my destination. Somebody can say, oh, I'm stuck here in one hour, look, I can go and do shopping, I can finally buy the gifts for my friends because I have to do it uh, since a couple of weeks. So you can change your activity plan in a way that actually you don't feel this delay because anyway, those are things you have to do somewhere, somewhere, so you can exploit the chance. And uh, maybe having a disruption means you're gonna change completely your schedule of activity. Maybe you are staying here longer, you work a bit more, or you go to the gym, or you meet some other friends. So in a sense, having a delay, a pure delay for a train, it's a relatively bad proxy for how people would be annoyed. And what we did is we studied this in uh, agent-based models. So we use Maxim and we say, okay, can we understand how people would be happy or unhappy? And uh, this is an ongoing work, so there is no final outcome yet. We studied the network of Zurich, which is a very dense multimodal network with trains, trams, uh, streetcar in colors, and buses in uh, gray. So you see it's very interconnected. You have a lot of possibilities to move around the network. We basically shut down the most heavily loaded link, which is a rail link. It's like uh, 50,000 passengers per day, and the disruption itself is like three hours is like 5,000 passenger affected, roughly. And um, unfortunately, the real life of Zurich is very good, so disruption like this are not extremely common. But at least we can simulate that. And what we see is basically the impact of information is great, is very large. So um, this would be the ideal activity plan for people. So people go somewhere, then they take a link, a public transport link, then they do maybe gym, I don't know, they go visit somebody, and then they go home. So this is the original plan, which is kind of calibrated with real life data. Then you have the pessimist people that if there is two hour disruption, what they do, they just wait. So they go to the bus stop or the train stop, they diligently wait that the airplane arrives. And of course, it's not arriving for two hours, and then at that, that moment, everybody leaves. And you see there are some unfortunate people which are actually never, let's say there, there's no train for them because it's too late, their service doesn't run. So this is kind of the worst case that can happen. I say that if people would be very, very silly, that's what you could do. Then you have the opposite case of people that are extremely smart. And they know things even before they happen. So if I tell you now, or let's say even better this morning, there would be a disruption at five o'clock in New York. So there would be no train traffic between this station and this station for two hours. What can you do? Well, you can take maybe your uh, gym and then you can do some other thing in the afternoon. Maybe you can take a car in case you have one and you want to travel so you have more change. This pink line are people that don't take the public transport anymore. And in this sense, you really minimize the impact of this. And then the utility between these two is actually very similar. The utility within these two is actually very different. So there is an uh, interesting gap where information can play a role in making people more or less happy, let's say even during bad disruption. And then final item, and that's uh, the closure of this talk, is basically how can we understand how far these models are from reality? And that's a very tricky question. 
And what we did, we are looking at tracking data. So we are looking at people that we can follow and see what they did. So looking at the revealed preferences in times of disruptions, we can understand what happened. So what we did, we developed a small app that you can load on your uh, smartphone. The app is very little battery intensive, so basically has uh, relatively bad quality of GPS, but relatively good battery, so basically people can let it run for weeks. And then we can filter, let's say, this mess into some clean path. We can load the path onto the <coughs> um, realized services, so we know which vehicle has been taken, where, when, and ideally we can make such a diary. So we can see people moving over time and dates. Yes. Um, so after the search, that that created a price or a price decision that maybe. Um, so we consider the Miley and so many. This is from scratch. So this has been developed from the very beginning with the battery consumption as low as possible, and this means we are using Google services. So we basically don't know what's happening. Google makes the magic for us. But the battery is basically uninfluenced, so we don't see any change. Let's say two, three percent less within one day, so people are actually not too much annoyed. And having a good response from people is crucial because otherwise people would get out of the system. And what we want instead, we want to get people as long as possible in the system, so we can see what is normal, what is exceptional. A disruption is something exceptional, but if you get just one data point, you're never going to be able to spot it out. So what you see here is a tracking of one student, and we have no clue what people were doing where. But we only know GPS location, which are color-coded. So this is home, probably. This is work during weekdays. At midday, uh, there's some bias. Other location may be movie theater, gyms, uh, house of friends, I don't know, shopping, whatever. In blue and green, we have the transport part, so the actually one where we care. And you see people take a walk in blue and take a bus or a whatever, uh, public transport in green. And the idea is to study uh, disruptions in this. And um, you might know that this Switzerland is not the best country for studying delays because there are not so many, and Zurich in particular. So actually in these two weeks, we could observe that the student is actually going to office at very regular time, probably you do the same. But there was no major change in terms of behavior, apart from one very small spot, which is this day here. So if you are extremely clever, you might have realized every day the person takes a walk, so he walks to the bus stop, takes one bus, waits for another bus, and then takes the green bus, the second one, and then goes to work. And this happens basically every day. So there are two blue, two green stripes everywhere, apart from one day in which there are three so something is different, actually. And that was the only difference we could spot in these two weeks. This day was actually a snowstorm. So there was not bus. Let's say there were some bus which were not running or not running according to the plan. So the idea is that looking at long enough, we are able to fish something that is not so common, and we are able to follow up with the people saying, what did you do? Why uh, did you get enough information? When did you get information? And so on. These ongoing work, so I cannot show you any more things than this. And actually, this brings me to the summary of this talk. Um, that started late, so my apologies, but what I try to convey is that railway traffic management models are existing, are complicated, and the more degrees of freedom you put in the picture, the more complex it is to use them. So if it's very, very simple to do one single action, that's probably already done in industry, if you have many choices, it should be disputable. If you have a lot of choices, then it's going to be dangerous for humans somehow. Um, if you look at unexpected things, like this disruption in Germany, this can look very positive if you look at the wrong thing. So having one perspective only might actually not give us the full picture. And this maybe brings to our philosophical question, what is the goal of the transport system? Is to have trains on time or to have people welfare, let's say, and transport uh, mobility realized. So we can discuss this endless, probably. And whenever we put passenger in the picture, we get a mess. So we have a lot of decision makers with different utility function, different information, different goals. So mathematical models are not able to include this yet at a very comprehensive picture. And even if we do, how we apply them? So how can we actually steer reality? 
towards what we say is a better solution than others. And uh, last, uh, we would like to understand more. Some system like with smart card can actually understand trip, uh, origin destination in Zurich, we don't have this, so we have to rely on these more complicated things. And the optimal decision for people ba is based on optimal control of the network that maybe we have the ambition to do, but also an optimal information you give to people so the people know they are doing the best, otherwise it can be just counterintuitive. And optimal from which point of view, the operator, the passenger, which passenger, so that's a lot of uh, open questions that probably would uh, start some quick discussion in this uh, time remaining. And I only thank you for being uh, waiting for me and being uh, alive and uh, attentive let's say, to this discussion and presentation. Thank you. Yes, please. Very good. Um, so what we did now, we took a matching model calibrated by the Axhausen, so by the group of Axhausen, which were uh, fitting, let's say, what they see in Zurich. What we also see is that matching itself is not the truth. So we have a lot of variability over iterations, and that, of course, brings some noise into our picture. The calibration at least would be uh, as reference cases so that we know somebody have perfect information, somebody don't, and we can maybe make clusters of people, like I don't know, we can simulate 10% of people are tech people that are checking the smartphone every five minutes, some other are maybe old people that they just uh, love to take bus number 40 and they will take it no matter what. So at least understanding this kind of segmentation. And for each segment, segment of this, we might estimate some two, three parameters. But the more parameters, the more messy it is to calibrate. Okay, yeah, so right now you're using that fast data and the data, but do you need the actual data to respond to the plan? Uh, because you're saying you need to see what they're doing? Yes, that's the idea. Let's say, ideally, we can even understand what the plan was, yeah. assuming that every Tuesday I do the same routine, then I can say, last week you did this, this week not. Uh, interesting, what did you do? So we can reach out the user and ask. So we can actually make follow up and prompt recall on this. And uh, we also know the social demographic of these people. So something with smart card, even you don't. So you don't know if this person is actually a businessman, if he has a car or not, and so on. So the idea is that by this, we can filter the normality and focus maybe on the two, three percent of exceptional things and there really point out things. The problem is that disruption happen randomly, most of them. Some of them happen with plan. So we have maintenance works. We can actually go and investigate, which means we need to have a lar large data set to actually filter something interesting. And that's our uh, struggle now. We are running this as of next week. We are going to collect like a uh, few thousand participants, hopefully. Maybe response rate is much less. So maybe let's say we have enough data points to make some conclusion. That's our goal. Yes. On the um, figure where you had the um, data set had people not change their schedule, so mm -hmm. the different people on each plane had two dots, you did that for that? This one, yeah. yeah. What's happening with the purple? So those are, uh, so those were people that were using public transit on the disrupted link uh, in the um, preference case. So those were people that normal life would be affected. And this, if you tell them, look, there's gonna be a disruption this afternoon, they actually are not taking public transport anymore. So they take a car or they stay home, so they just get out of our public transport system. And other people, let's say in this case, we did not even consider capacity and secondary effects. Otherwise, you might know uh, if there is a, let's say if I take a public route, I don't know, 40, and I know one day the metro would be closed, directly have no impact, but I can assume that many people from the metro would actually take my bus, I would be pissed off and maybe I take another route. So let's say you have even indirect effects sometimes. And in theory we can model that, but the more modeling, the more complex it is to understand which parameter, how big should we be and so on. Yes. 
Ja. Um, to some extent we could. So not in this study case. Um, let's say you might have different cooperative parts. Let's say the users can help each other. So they can basically share the surplus by saying, okay, I take this route, but then you give me some something back. Or you have some repeated cooperative games in which I help you today so that you can help me tomorrow. Probably that's what happens maybe more in real life. That would be a possibility, let's say. We didn't study this in detail at the moment. Um, the idea is that the coalition forming mechanism should require a lot of understanding with each other, I suppose. So in my case, the traffic control person would never ever need the people, unless they promise something. So let's say if I tell you, uh, I have this delay in the network, I'm telling you in advance, if you do this, please uh, give a sign. And then you have kind of clicker apps in which you can say, I promise to take this route. Then of course I would be very happy because I know how my action would be. So in that sense, you can even put some cooperative games and you can put some rewards to steer the system optimal rather than the user optimal. So my, that would be very cool, but I don't see this working in real life yet. The other option is to filter the information like Google Maps. So you have three options. You can choose only these three and you don't know the rest which maybe smart users commuting every day are able to circumvent and know, ah, oh, I know better, I have this other route. But let's say tourists like me probably fail completely. Ah, it's A, B, and C, I choose B because it's the intermediate one. So it's a very strong way to steer demand in a sense. Very, very true. So in a sense, if I tell you to do something, I have no interest in lying to you because I know that tomorrow you can have the same situation. So let's say you have a virtual compliance, which is enforced by the fact that if I tell you something wrong, after some days you will learn and then you will kind of not do it. Let's say if your GPS tells you to take this route, it's gonna be one hour and you do it every day, it's gonna be two hours. After some time, you don't believe it anymore. I'll just take something else. So you have a uh, filtered compliance in your decision making, which is very difficult to model. But if you assume that people are aware of this, then you can simplify a bit your uh, three things. Thank you. Ah, okay. Okay. Okay, excellent. Basically, what you were talking about is the trap problem of a spaghetti. Uh -huh. How you can control 